it's okay. I'm not going to buy it. Buy it. No, it's okay. This is them. Հարգելի արոստադիտողներ, ես ես ողջունում եմ սիլների թի ուղղը խարարցակման ընթացքում, մենք այսպային գտում ենք Հայաստանի ամերիկյան համալսարնում, այստեղ շուտ ով կմեք նարկի անցում այն արդադության վերաբեր մարմինների ներդրման մասին մասնապես նա ասած, մեջ բերեմ, որ անարշտ է մոտ ապագայում լուջ կնարկում ներ ունենալ և անցումային արդադեցության մարմիններիր ստեղծելու մասին որոշում ընդունել, կանի որ մենք ունենք դրանց Այս հայտարությունից հետո մեկ նարկեց անցում էին արդալեցյան վերաբրիալ կնարկումները, հարց էր առաջանում, թե ինչ մեխանիզմներ պետք է ներդրվեն, խոսվեց նաև ճշմարդության հանձնաժողումների գիրարման մասին։ Հիշեցնե� մարմիններից մեկ ավել ճիրտ։ Ներդրվում է համակարգ, որով նախկինում նախկին իշխանության որոգ տեղ ունեցած բախումների առանցությում զոնված անձանց հուշն է հարգվում, ինչպես որինակ մարդի մեկի սոհերի հուշարձան տեղադրել և պոպողթյուններ իրական ասնել։ Ինչև է անդրադարնալով այս կնարկմանը տեղեկացնեմ, որ այստ որակարքի բանախոսներն են ույլիամ շապսը, Քրիական իրավունքի և մարդու իրավունքների պաշպանության � Եվ ունի շուրջ 20 տարվա փորձ անցում այն արդայության ոլորդում։ Բարնի ավակոն հակամարդությունների միշնարդության ոլորդում փորձարություն ունեցող պաստաբան է, ով համատեղության պաշխատում է որպես � իմպակ թապի գործադիր տնորեն Սարա անջարգոլյանը։ Ես նկատեցի, որ կնարկմանը հրարվիրված են նաև առաջին փող վարճապետ առատ միրզոնյանը, այստեղ է նաև հատուկ կնչականց առայության պետ Սասուն Այս կնարկում իրականասնում է կանադայի զորյան ինստիտութը Հայաստանի ամերիկյան համարսանի էտ համատեղ։ Բացման խոսքով հանձես կգա պոխվարճապետ առատ միր զորյանը։ Հանցումային արդադության ոլորդում համաշխային ճանաչում ունեցող փորձագետները, որոնց անունները ես նշեցի արդեն, հրավիրվել են երևան որպեսի տեսական որեն ներկայցնեն անցումային արդադատությունը ե
Mi şart paçarlar kantı inçüe varşapet Nikol Paşçyan'a handes yekel ansmayın arsadıcın ara çarkelov ve pes hastan martar da tuçun hastatalı görcik ansmayın arsadıcın mücazik en kentroni hamadzayın ansmayın arsadıcın verabilme bolur aynı severin varans mücazof hakka martuçyan yevcinsman artıyın kum zevavur vaziyer kenerle paykarımın martuvi davunkneri line atzaval yev sistematik haktum neri dem yev ay depkerin aynkan şaten uzana kışır var. Artada için kanuna var. Ama kar ki vicak içe linum hamarca kalır zerner gel. Ancak ben artada için hamarum artuna ve kurtik çünkü neri diye pay kariye var çünkü artada tuçan hasta etmen yevkauçan hasta etmen hamar. Aslında depkum institüsyonal bari pahun neri karvan zarar var pes ancak ben artada için hamar pataskan bagadırıc. Nuin ancak ben artada için mijaz ki kentroni kentroni neşüme var mecburen varong. Kurt unen mart vira vunkneri çara şaman et kurt unen çok petakan karuys nerim bari pakunleri karuven ansuma in artadı için karavur çaproş işliyor. Hasar kekan karuys neri vosti kanıcan razman kan yevdata kan hama kar kiri bari pakumu karuven neralal petakan karuys neri vira nayman yev vira karusman kurtun tas neir var pisi neden kargın martu ira vunkneri pahpana neorun ki gera kayıtsın yev haşvetu lina nirens vasta ortneri iver çayın karagay kanxel xahtun neri karkanıtsın. Aşutof kim meknar ki knar kuma. Hello.
Hello and welcome to the Symposium on Transitional Justice, organized by the Zorian Institute and the American University of Armenia. My name is Megan Reed and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Zorian Institute and I am the Program Manager for this Symposium. Before we start today's program, I wanted to bring to your attention the cards that you'll find on your seats. Uh, these cards will provide the program for today as well as a brief description of the organizers of the event. There are a few changes to today's program. Um, firstly, we'll be bypassing the scheduled break. This will allow um, a, a, the flow of discussion between panelists, um, but coffee will be served after the symposium. Uh, um, unfortunately, Barney Afako's flight to Armenia has been delayed, um, but we are hoping that he will be joining us at the end of the symposium. So he will be, he'll be moved to the, to the last panelist of the day. It is very important that we stay as close to the schedule as possible as our panelists are, have a very busy day ahead of them and only are here for one day. Um, and at this time, I would like to welcome AUA Provost Randall Rhodes to the stage to do his opening remarks. On behalf of President Armin de Karegi and the faculty, staff, and students of the American University of Armenia, I welcome you to our campus. Founded in 1991, the AUA aims to have an impact on students and the community as a center of academic excellence, innovation, inquiry, and diversity that contributes to the further development and advancement of Armenia through teaching and scholarship, fostering creativity, integrity, and community service. Of high priority is helping Armenia succeed as a more engaged, prosperous, and well-governed society with inclusive and sustainable growth and more participatory, effective, and accountable governance. In collaboration with the Zorian Institute of Canada, AUA is hosting today's International Academic Symposium on Transitional Justice. Today you will hear from speakers who, based on their scholarship and research on past examples, will provide theoretical frameworks and case studies for the contextualization and implementation of transitional justice. This discourse is opportune for Armenia. This is an historical moment as the nation turns a page in its narrative, addresses its past, and designs a roadmap for its future, and a renewed focus on issues of human rights, the preservation of the rule of law, and accountability to its constituents. As will be discussed, many countries have utilized transitional justice during times of transition to address past grievances, current structural and systematic flaws, and fundamentally to set the foundations for transparent governance. The first consideration is institutional reform, where accountability leads to the restoration of public confidence, then to the broader fight against corruption. What will transitional justice look like in Armenia? A national dialogue legislative and constitutional reforms, ensuring a meritocracy in the appointment of state employees, criminal accountability, and changing the culture and value system of these institutions. Again, on behalf of AUA, I thank you for coming today and participating in today's symposium. Thank you very much. I would li now like to invite President of the Zorian Institute, Greg Gurkian Sarkisian, to the stage for his welcoming remarks. Medzako Hayastania Rabeduchan, Arachim Pochvachabet. Arkeli, Kalavaragan, Marmini Nergachner, 
հարկելի խոսնակներ, հյուրեր, գործ ընգերներ եմ ընգերներ։ Ինձ եգները իմ ճարս ես կրած է անգտերինով, բայց առաջարգեցին, որ պետք է հայերինով ներգայացնեմ և արև էլ հայերինով պետք է ներգայացնեմ, ո 2018 թվագանի ոկոստոս 17-ին իր գարավարման հայրյուր որվան նվիրված խոսքում Հայաստանի վարճապետ Նիկոլ պաշինյանը առաջարգեց մեջ պերում եմ, որ պետք է լրջ որ եմ մտածենք անցումային արդարդադության նոր մարմի ներց է ավորելու բաց անցիկ շանագում են իրենց արդավոր կորդնեությունը կան նաև պազմաթիվ թերություներ որենստության մեջ։ Վարճապետ պաշինյանի անցումային արդրադատությամբ Հայաստանում արդարություն հասատելու առաջարգը իր հիմքում Հանցումային արդարադատությունը այն դարպերակն է, որ ընդրում են կոնվլիկտային և ռեպրեսիվ երգիններում մարդու իրավոնքների այնքան մեզածավալ և սիստեմատիկ խաղթումների ու գորուպցիայի թեպքում, որին թադագան համագար� պոխադուցման արդարադության, վերականքնման, հաշտեցման և խաղաղության համար։ Հայաստանի թեպքում ինստությունալ պարեպախումները գարող են ձարայեր որբես լավ հիմք անցումային արդարադության հաստատման համար։ Այս ներքրավված բետագան մարմիններու պարեպոխումները կարող են լավ չապման միջոս լիներ անցումային արդրադատության համար։ Ոստիկանության, ռազմագան և թադագան համագարքերի պարեպոխումները կարող են ներարել այնբիսի որենքի կերագայությունը եվ լինեն հաշվեդու իրեն շահարուների։ Սեպտեմպեր կսամեգին անգախության որվա նվիրված իր խոսկում վարճապետը ասաց, որ բետագանաշինության մեջ մեր ծերպերումները անժխտելի են։ Իսկ աբես չ ուղարապաղյան բադրազմի նման իրողությունների աստեցությանը, Հայաստանը 27-ը դարիների ընթացկում զարկացել է և ունեցել է նշանավոր հաչողություններ։ 1991-ին սեպտեմպեր 21-ին Հայաստանը անգախություն հրջագեց։ Մ Հայաստանը ունդունեց նոր սահմանատրություն և թացավ մագի անտան։ Բանագա ամբրաբնդվեց և արդիագանացվեց։ Պատվեցին նոր հաստադություններ այս տվուլ նաև այս հաստադությունը Հայաստանի ամերիկյան համասարանը, � 1988-ին զորյանը խթանել է Հառապայան խնդրի իրազեկման մտավորագան չանքերը։ 1988-ի մարդի 15-ինք որվա անթացքում զորյանը ստեղծեց դը կարապաղ վայլ 200 էչանոց աշխատությունը վրանսերենով և անքլերենով հաչորտեց Սում գայթի ողպերկություն աշխադանքը, որ խմպավորեց այդ ողպերկությունը վերաբրազներին, վգայություններ ու դղեկացրեց աշխարին, 
Teaderbejanum hayeri negatmam kadar vaz vayra kucuneri masin. Hazar inar inisuningin zoryan anga hayastanun gazmar gevet aracin hame madagan tegaspanucan konferansı. Bazmatif hedazozucuneri şarkum zoryan naev havana vorele Wolfgang Gusti gome kermanagan artakin korzeri nakaralucan arxivneri habaka kruma hampa kruma takmanucuna yev rabaragum. Saat arsav tegaspanucan anjıhteli pas. Yevtarçar azdetik kail kemanagan buntus buntes takum hayot çağaspanuçan untunman masin orenki nergayetman hamar. Mer pazmativ zrakrera verçin yere sunvets darineri intatskum hayastanum yevhanun hayastani itsu central mer arjeknera vor kidelika uje tarnum miam pasteri Եվ վերդությունների կրթության միջոցով Գարավարման հայրուր օրվա իր խոսքում Վարչավետ Փաշինյան նշեց Մեջբերում եմ որ մեր Գարավարման համագարքը գարիք ունի լուրջ փոփոխությունների եւ այդ փոփոխումները ներողություն լուրջ փոփոխումների եւ այդ փոփոխումները պետք է լինեն ինստիտուցիոնալ եւ գազմակերպչական Երկրի հետակա գարավարման անհնարին գլինի առանց արժունավետ պրոֆեսիոնալ մարտագետրոն գարավարման համագարքի։ Զորյան ինստիտուտը պրոֆեսոր Վիլիամ Շեյբսի Զորյան Զորյանի հոգապարտների խորհրդի անդամ մարդու իրավունքների ոլորտում աշխարհաշակ գիտնականի խորհրդակցությամբ հավատում է որ ակադեմական եւ վերլուծական սիմպոզիումի կազմակերպումը Այս պահին գծարայի Զորյան Զորյանի քիդության եւ գրտության միջոցով մարդու իրավունքների աճակցելու արակելությանը Պրոֆեսոր Շեբսը հրավիրել է միջազգային ճանաչում ունեցող փորձակետներով միանալու իրեն այս սիմպոզիումին որբեսի որբես խոսնակներ իր առաջնորդության Ինստիտուտը նախաձեռնել է այս պահին անրաժեշտ անցումային արտահայտության սիմպոզիումը։ Մեր արժեքների զուգահեռ Զորյանը այսօր այստեղ է խթանելու մտավորական դիսկուրսը անցումային արտահայտության քաղաքարի լուրջ խիստ ակադեմական տեսանկյունից զուրկ ոևէ քաղաքական շահակրթություններից։ Ինձ համար բարիվ է Եվ հաջելի մեր մեծարկո խոսնակների քիդելիկների միջոցով աճակցել Հայաստանում իրազերգվածության փարսացմանը։ Ես ուզում եմ շնորհակալություն հայտնել նրանց, որ իրականություն դարձրեցին այս միջոցառումը։ Շնորհակալություն եմ հայտնում Վարչապետ Փաշինյանի այս սիմպոզիումի քաղաքարով ոգեշնչելու համար մեզ Վարչապետի աշխատակաց աշխատակազմից Դավիթ Գարաբեդյանին Մեր Քորձնգեր Ամերիկյան համասարանի դարացքի դրամատուրգի համար եւ շահագործ եւ համակորզակցության Ուզում եմ խորին շահագարչուն հայտնել Մարիա Տիտիզյանին եւ Իվիեն Ռիպորթի թիմին Շահագարչուն հայտնել Պրոֆեսոր Շապասին Մեր խոսնակներին եւ ուզում եմ շահագարչուն ասել Ձեր փոլորիտ որ ներգայեք խոս այսօր եւ անոնք որոնք դիտում են հերոստասեսով կամ համագարքի էկրանից ցեր հետաքրքրությունը ու ներգայությունը այսօրվա միջա միջա ցարման հաճողության կարևոր մասն է կազմում այս սիմպոզիումը փոլորիս համար է որբեզի մենք կարող մնանք ծավորել դեղեգացված գարձիկներս այս արդիական հիմնակարային խնդրի մասին Ուզում եմ խոսքս ավարտել մի անձնական պատմությամբ Երկու դարի առաջ Արայիկ Անունով Հայաստանցի իմիգրանտ նոյեկավ Զորյանի Քրասենյակ Գամավորական աշխատանք անելու ցանկությամբ Նա պատմեց որ Կանադա է քաղտել 3 ամիս առաջ իր գնոչ որ փժիշկուհի է եւ իր 7-ամյա զավգի հետ նա կդել է լավ աշխատանք 
եւ իր ընտանիքը լայ է զգում ես հետա կրկրվեցի ինչու նման մարդիկ ցանկություն ունեն լքելու հայաստանը որտեղ կարող են աշխատանք ունենալ եւ լավ ծեւով ապրել ես հարցեցի նրան եւ նրան բադասխանը շատ սուրեր եւ ասաց Զորյանը մարդու իրավունքներու զբաղվող գազմակերպություն է ու ես վստահեմ որ դուք ծանոթ եք մարդու իրավունքների ընդհանուր հճակագրին հետ ես պատասխանեցի թե հճակագրի առաջին խոտվածում ասվում է թե փոլոր մարդիկ ծնված են ազատ եւ հավասար իրենց արժանապատվությամբ եւ իրավունքներով այդ գետը արդասանելուց հետո նա ասաց ես ունեի ամեն բան հայաստանում բայց ես չունեի արժանապատվություն եւ ես հասկացա որ չեմ կարող թույլ դա որ իմ որդուն ապրել ամբողջ յանքը առանց արժանապատվությամբ արայգի եւ այդ պատճառով հայաստանը լքածների բադվին Ես նվիրավու նվի նվիրապերում եմ 100000 քանդական դոլար կամ 37 միլիոն դրամ Զորյան ինստիտուտի մարդկային արժանապատության հիմնադրամը մեկնարկելու Հայաստանի մեջ Այս հիմնադրամի նվադակն է ֆերել հավաքել համաշխարհային մարդկային փորձակետներ համար համար համաշխարհային մագարտակի փորձակետներ Հայաստանը որպես Հայաստանի մեջ որպես է նրանք օգնեն փարելավեն քորձող օրենսդրությունը ես խրախ խոսում եմ Զորյանի ինստիտուտի ընկերներին հայ համայնքի եւ սփիրքի կազմակերպություններին եւ անհատներին նույնպես մասնակցելու հիմնադրամ մեկնարկին անկախ նվիրատվությունների ու քումարի չափից ես ուսում եմ որ նմադիպ սիմպոզիումներ եւ մարդկային արժանապատվության հայաստանի հիմնադրամը կօգնեն գարուցել երկիր հայաստան երկիր ուր հայերու հայերը ուզում են ապրիլ երկիր որ նրանք երջանիկ են բայց մանավանդ ունեն արժանապատվություն շնորհակալություն I would now like to welcome His Excellency First Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister Mr. Arat Mirzoyan to the stage for his opening remarks. Varevdis. Nakh tsankanum em shnorakalutsun haytnel Zoryan Institutein yev Hayastani Amerikan Hamarsarnin Հայաստանի հանրապետության համար նման էական եւ միևնույն ժամանակ ոչ այնքան ստանդարտ գործընթացի վերաբերյալ քննարկում կազմակերպելու եւ այդ քննարկմանը միջազգային հեղինակություն ունեցող էքսպերտների հրավիրելու համար։ Ասացի արդեն, որ խոսքը բավականին ոչ ստանդարտ մի գործընթացի մասին է եւ հետեւաբար կրկնակի կամ եռակի անգամ ավելի կարեւոր է հասկանալ ինչու է իսկապես անհրաժեշտ այս գործընթացը ինչ նպատակներ այն ունի ինչ խնդիրներ է լուծելու եւ ինչ գործիքակազմ է կիրառելու եւ ուրեմն անկեղծ շատ անկեղծ խոսակցություն պիտի ունենան կիրառել հակնհայտ է որ վերջին երկու տասնամյակից ավել ժամանակ ատվածում հայաստանի հանրապետությունում պարբերաբար եղել են մարդու քաղաքական տնտեսական սոցիալական իրավունքների զանգվածային խախտումներ եւ լայնածավալ չարաշահումներ այդ թվում տարբեր դրսևորումներով տեղի է ունեցել իշխանության բռնազավթում սա պետք է հստակ գիտակցել ապօրինի ազդեցություն է գործադրվել ընտրական գործընթացների վրա կեղծվել են ընտրությունների արդյունքները բռնություն է գործադրվել խաղաղ ցուցարների նկատմամբ ճնշվել է քաղաքական այլակարծությունը հանրային շահի անվան տակ սեփական ազրկվել են քաղաքացիներ 
ոչ միայն պետական ապարատում, այլև հանրային ծառացիների գրեթ է բոլոր ոլորդներում, առող չապավությունից մինչև կրթություն և սոցիալական ապավություն, արկային եղել լայնածավալ կորուպթյոն երևույթներ, տեղե ունեցել մեծ ու փոքր բազմաթիվ պաշտոնյաների ապորինի հարստացում։ Տնտեսության և բիզնեսի գրեթ է բոլոր ոլորդներում, արկային եղել ազատ տնտեսական հարաբերությունները խոչնդոտող երևույթներ, մենաշնորներ, հսկայական ստվեր։ Հայաստանի հանրապետությունում տեղի ունեցած վերջի նարմատական պապոխություններից հետո, երբ վերջապես հեղափոխությունից հետո իշխանությունը վերադարձվել է ժողովրդին և հնարավորություն է ստեղցվել կարուցել ժողովրդավարության, ա� Եվ երևիտ է կոչված էլ չի լուծել թվարկացս համակարկային խնդիրները և արձանագրել լուծումներ։ Ուստի կվազի ժողորդավարական ռեժիմից դեպի իսկական ժողորդավարություն անցնելու այս շրջանին մեր երկիրը կարիք ունի անցումային արդարադատության վերաբերյալ միացյալ ազգերի կազմակերպության չապորոշիշներն ամրագրող պաստատղթի տրամաբանությունը և համահունչ այդ տրամաբանության մեր երկրում անցումային արդարադատություն իրականացվել անցումային արդարադացյան երկրորդ, անցումային արդարադացյան գործիկա կազմի միջոցով լուծ էլ վերոնուշեալ չարաշահումների հետևանքով այսօր Հայաստանի արջև կանգնած խնդիրները, արմատավորել իրավունքի գերակայությունը, ա� կարծում ենք, որ անրաժեշտ է նախ և առաջ իրականացնել որեզդրական և ինստիտությոնալ բարեպխումներ, ստեղծել համապատասխան մարմին կամ մարմիններ, որոնք հաճախ տարբեր երկրներում կոչվում են ճշմարտության կամ անցումային արդարդրատությունը կոչված է լրացնելու, համալրելու գործող համակարգը և այն ամենևին ինքնապկողոչ հեղափոխական տրիբունալների հարկայությունը չէ, ինչպես կարող է ոմանց թվալ առաջին հայացքից։ Ապա, ուսում խաղթումներից դուժած անձանց։ Կարտեզագրել պատճարված վնասի հատուցման մեխանիզները և ուղությունները։ Ստեղծել խաղթումներ կատարած և խաղթումներից դուժած անձանց հանրային երկխոսության և հաշտեցման հարթա� և աստանրաժեշտության սահմանել հիշատակի միջոցառումներ, նպատակ ունենալով կանխել ապագայում նման խաղթումների հնարավորությունը։ Եվ վերջում կարևոր եմ համանում շեշտել, որ անցումային արդարադարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդ Եվ Հայաստանի Հանրապետության ստանձնած միջազգային պարտավորություններին խիստ համապատասխան։ Այս պահին թերևս այսքանն է, որ մենք ատկերացնում ենք անցումային արդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդարդ Եվ շնորակալություն եմ հայտնում Ես շնորակալություն եմ հայտնում կննարկման կազմակերպիշներին և մասնակիցներին, մեզ բոլորիս մաղթում եմ առարկայական արդյունավետ կննարկում, հուսով եմ նշացս դրույթները մեծապես
coordinator for the symposium, Sarah An Anjargolian, is the founder and CEO of Impact Hub Yerevan. She received her law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Before moving to Armenia, Sarah served as a trial lawyer with the United States Department of Justice and Deputy City Attorney with the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. I would now like to ask Sarah to take it from here and introduce our panelists for today's symposium. Do I press something? Oh, I guess not. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have an empty chair to my left. We're very much hoping uh, that Barney Afaka will make it. He, he missed his uh, flight last night, but I understand he is on his way. Thank you very much to the Zorian Institute, to the American University of Armenia, as well as to media partner EVN Report for the opportunity to moderate this very important and timely discussion. Sincere thanks to our accomplished panelists who have agreed to join us to delve into a topic that's, of course, incredibly relevant internationally, but especially relevant today in Armenia. So um, I get to be a bit of a conductor today of the Transitional Justice Orchestra and uh, would like to just talk about the format. The format will be that I will introduce uh, each speaker. Each speaker will speak for about 30 minutes. I may ask some follow-up questions and once we've had a chance to hear all of the speakers, we will then move on to your questions. We will not be taking questions and answers uh, at microphones. Uh, rather, we would ask you to please write down your questions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the cards that have already been passed out. Or if you are listening to us uh, uh, around the world or online, please do write your questions underneath the link uh, EVN Reports Facebook page. There's a link to the live. Please put your questions there under the comments and those questions will be fed to me and I will give them at the end. Uh, if you are tweeting and posting on social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag, uh, hashtag TJArmenia2018. So that's the housekeeping part. And so without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Dr. William Shabus is an international criminal and human rights law expert, a professor at Middlesex University and Leiden University. He has served as the head of the United Nations Gaza Commission as well as Commissioner on the Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Dr. Shabas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have to revise that note when you introduce me as an international criminal and then go on. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it international human rights and criminal law expert. My apologies. I'm not okay. a very good conductor after all. My apologies. <laughs> It's a great uh, pleasure to, to be here. Uh, back in uh, Yerevan, I visited Armenia uh, many times, uh, always uh, to talk about the past, um, about the genocide uh, and the aftermath of the genocide and about justice for genocide in Armenia and in other uh, parts of the world as well. Uh, and this time it's to talk not just about the past, which is relevant to transitional justice, but also about the future. Because I think this is probably where transitional justice sets itself uh, apart, or at least it, um, underscores its uniqueness, is that it is about dealing with a past that is behind you, you've drawn a line, and about moving forward. So it involves compromises, complex compromises and decisions. I come at it as, as you do, Sarah, we come as lawyers, we look for rigid, we like legal rules and policies that we can apply in a, in a strict manner. And we're uncomfortable actually when a degree of discretion enters the calculation. But this is a subject that is all about discretionary choices because it's about balancing different interests, a need for justice, for accountability, respect for the victims and their entitlement to see that justice is done, but also uh, broader concerns about building something new and about changing the, 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 the future of a country. It's a great privilege to be here at this uh, fantastic moment in the history of uh, 
of your country. I'm so grateful to be a part of it and even to make a, a minor uh, contribution to the discussions and to the past that, that you choose. I should say no one's mentioned it yet, but I would be remiss if I didn't also just say one word of sympathy about the loss of the great troubadour who is being buried today, I guess, in, in Paris, um, and who we all mourn. Transitional justice is a notion, it's a concept, it's an expression that is about 25 years old. I think there are two American or American US-based scholars who quarrel a little bit about who invented the term. When I say quarrel, they're friends and they each say the other invented the term. <laughs> Uh, Ruti Taitel, you'll know she has a book on, on transitional justice, and Neil Critz, who did a three-volume collection. Both of them started using the term at some point around 92 or 93. Uh, so almost exactly a quarter of a century we've been talking about it. It's good for Armenia because you've got 25 years now of experience and practice and reflection on what this process is all about to inform what you do and to develop really what should be a unique, innovative, who knows, 25 years from now people will talk about the Armenian path or the Armenian approach. It's an opportunity to be creative but drawing on the lessons of all of the other uh, um, experiences with transitional justice. In the early 90s, we were talking about three different types of transitional problems. Um, the first one, which is maybe the one that's, that's closest to, to the situation here, was associated with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the needs of countries, mainly in Central and Eastern Europe, to deal with the crimes and problems of the past. So they had to deal, uh, to take on, for example, in Germany, the issues of the killings of people trying to uh, cross over into West Berlin or to West Germany and the killings by the border guard. So hard core criminal law violations, killings, arbitrary killing of people. And so that was one, of, one part of the issue. Uh, but there were also issues that are also very important um, concerning, for example, the vetting, or what's called sometimes lustration. It's, it's not a term that's so commonly, not everybody who is fluent in English even knows the term lustration, but vetting is well understood. I think the UN has opted now for vetting rather than lustration. And this is the idea that you purge your existing um, system of the people who were responsible for the abuses of the past. And that's a complicated process my other, my colleagues, I think, will say more about that. It's probably something of concern to a lot of people in this country who are wondering where the where the line will be drawn. Um, it's it's worth recalling. I think it's worth mentioning that it takes place in a context that wouldn't have existed 25 years ago, and before that, because all of this is taking place within the framework of the European Convention of human rights and the uh, possible intervention of the European Court of Human Rights. So, of course, you have a great constitution, but you also have that level of international supervision that should reassure people who are nervous that their rights may be violated in the course of this process. So that's the, that, that was one of the parts of transitional justice in the early days. The second um, kind of laboratory, in a way, for transitional justice was the, the former the dictatorships in Latin America, particularly in what's called the Southern Cone, Argentina, Chile, um, Uruguay, um, to some extent Brazil. These were countries where you had had very brutal dictatorships and where there were thousands of deaths attributed to them, high, high level of extraordinarily brutal uh, repression and military governments. And so you had dysfunctional regimes and there were transitions that also involved to a certain extent the recognition by the people in power that they had to hand over the reins of power. And so it also involved a degree of compromises with them to get them to let go. And so that was, that generated special issues in that part of the world, in particular about amnesties 
whether or not you could give amnesties. Amnesties were a common feature there where they said, we'll draw a line with the past, we'll move on, just get out of the way, and we'll, we'll forget about the past. And, and so that was a problem, and that was something that those countries have returned to again and again and are still doing. They're still revisiting the events uh, of the 1970s and the 1980s. There are, of course, many survivors, families, people who are still, for whom those uh, terrible uh, acts of the late 1970s are, are still quite fresh. And th so it's an ongoing process. And I think this is a, also a very useful point to bear in mind. Transitional justice, you'll still be doing it 25 years from now. This is just the beginning. You know, it's not even the end of the beginning, as Churchill said. This is the beginning of the beginning of transitional justice. And it will evolve and change. And, and you will approach it in, in different ways. And there may be things that get shelved or get put aside or, or don't get done properly now that you'll return to in five years or ten years when you're ready or when you see the needs differently than you do in the, in the freshness of this um, very immediate post-revolutionary uh, environment. And then the third uh, context, which I think was also very influential in those early days uh, of transitional justice, was the experience in South Africa. And South Africa, of course, went through a transition that was in a way negotiated very clearly and quite visibly between two men who ultimately both won, won the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts, the clerk and Mandela. And essentially, they made a kind of a pact that they would forego prosecution for the past, but not efforts at, at uh, trying to clarify the truth and the memory of the past, but that they would forego under certain circumstances criminal prosecution uh, in return for an agreement to a peaceful transition to a pluralist democracy. And that was, of course, that paved the way for the election of Nelson Mandela in uh, 1994. And uh, Mandela was faithful to that commitment and the South African government uh, did that and addressed the issues of the past by um, th through most famously a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I want to say a little more about Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. I, I know that that's on the agenda here. It's something that's being considered. It's something that I have personal experience with because uh, in the aftermath of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, there were others that were established. There had been some before South Africa as well. And the South Africans borrowed a lot from a Truth Commission in Chile. Chile had had its, its Truth Commission in about 1990. And by the way, it had a second one many years later. That's when I say you, you'll still be doing this in 25 years. Uh, it's an example of a country that had a Truth Commission, got the truth, but later realized that maybe they hadn't got the whole truth and they needed to revisit it and go back and do it. So that's one of the things that happens in transitional justice as well. My experience with it was with in Sierra Leone, another African country where there was a, a, a terrible civil war. So not like South Africa where there was a, a, a racist apartheid regime, but a country where there'd been a, a civil war and where there were atrocities committed on all sides by all of the combatants. And then there was a negotiated peace agreement. And the only way they could get to peace in the peace agreement was to promise the warring parties that they wouldn't be prosecuted. So there was a full amnesty given in the peace agreement. But, and some said this was just to sugarcoat the amnesty. Um, I think there were people who were cynical about the amnesty and thought it was just a way to calm people down, and others who saw it as a genuine alternative to criminal prosecution, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established. And I was one of the commissioners. There were seven commissioners in the Truth Commission. Four of them were Sierra Leonean, and then three were uh, appointed on the recommendation of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so that's where, where I came in. I was one of the people who was proposed, and I spent two years working there in Sierra Leone uh, from 2002 to 2004, developing the report. People often ask me, as they do with all of these transitional justice uh, experiences, did it work? 
Did it work? Um, you know, is my glass half full? Is my glass half empty? That's usually what the conversation is about. It's, first of all, it's difficult to know whether successful transitions are a result of the transitional justice efforts at all, or whether they would have happened anyway, even if you'd done nothing. Just as it's difficult to know that when there appear to be problems and obstacles uh, years later, that they are, bec they are a result of the inability or the failure of the mechanisms, including the Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission, to do its job. I think it's good to bear in mind this famous saying by the former Chinese Premier, Zhou Enlai. Zhou Enlai apparently, he met Charles de Gaulle at some point uh, at some international conference and they had a conversation and de Gaulle asked Zhou Enlai, uh, uh, or no, Zhou Enlai asked Charles de Gaulle whether, no, it was Zhou Enlai who said it. Charles de Gaulle asked Zhou Enlai, did he think the French Revolution was a success? And Zhou Enlai replied, in about 1965, it's too early to tell. <laughs> so this is the problem with transitional justice, is, is also with assessing it. But we can see many examples of countries. Sierra Leone is one of them. South Africa is another, where at the very least they're at peace, where there have been accomplishments, and where the transitional justice mechanisms, first of all, have not done any harm, which is the one thing, you want to make sure you don't do any harm doing it. And in many cases, there's very visible forward progress in, 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 in many of these countries. So it's certainly important. It's an important thing to do. It's something that probably societies always did to some extent. So we can go back, we can look in the last century at the end of the two great world wars, there were trials. That's a form of transitional justice, having trials. Uh, transitional justice doesn't replace trials. The Deputy Prime Minister said this earlier. It's not a substitute for trials, but it is um, a complement to trials. And it's also a recognition that sometimes you can't do trials for everybody. Mm -hmm. There are reasons why you can't often very legitimate ones. Uh, sometimes, of course, you can't get the people. You can't catch them. Nobody put Hitler on trial. They couldn't catch him. He was dead already. It was too late. And yet you needed some justice to deal with it. Sometimes there are political problems, and this is a very difficult part of the equation. I've referred to other, uh, other contexts and other examples where there were compromises made in exchange for the former regime giving up power. Sometimes that's quite explicit, as it was in South Africa. Sometimes I think it's more implicit, it's more implied, um, that when the, those who were in power and who were responsible for the abuses understand that maybe they can survive and they're not going to go and spend the rest of their lives in jail um, or in poverty or in disgrace, um, that they take a step back and they don't interfere with things moving forward. So this varies, of course, is going to vary from, from country to country. Um, but sometimes the criminal justice route is not just simply not viable. Now I understand, I'm, I'm careful uh, here to speak about the, the specific context in Armenia because I know a lot about Armenia 100 years ago. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't speak here confidently to people who know it intimately and are deeply involved in the, in the political transformation of the country. So I, I want to be careful. I'm really just bringing some international experience to the, to the debate. But one of the problems, of course, uh, that has been mentioned is uh, corruption and terrible corruption. And uh, the corruption is ultimately a polite name for theft. Theft of, of uh, someone said at lunch the million dollar question, and I said I think more than a million is involved in this uh, in this uh, in this million dollar question, and I guess you'd like to get the money back, or as much of it as you can. Now, lots of countries have experience with that, even countries that aren't really in a transition and where they just say to the to the uh, corrupt criminals, 
uh, corruption even, you know, it's it's not unknown. We had a case in the newspaper, the New York Times earlier this week of heads of state to have been involved in tax fraud. I won't mention, mention any names here to be polite, but where, where, where tax fraud, many countries deal with this and sometimes they say, you know, it's gonna be complicated to prosecute you, give back the money and we'll give you a break. And then they negotiate how much they'll give back and, and, and so that's, I, I mean, I see that as part of it, but of course, that is making a compromise with justice. It's not saying we're going to punish without compromise uh, everybody who was responsible for the crimes. So I, I see that as something, again, I'm, I'm, obviously I'm not telling you anything you don't know and that you haven't already considered. You're fortunate here in that with with perhaps a few exceptions, you don't have to deal with the the, the most difficult parts that we encounter in, in countries. In Sierra Leone, I would see people who'd had their arms and legs chopped off during the conflict. They would come to the Truth Commission and testify, and they'd say, the person who chopped off my arms and legs got an amnesty. And that's hard to deal with. That's very hard because victims are entitled to to justice, and victims of that type of crime are often, they don't really care too much when you say to them, yeah, but we had to make a compromise for the peace in the future, and they say, I don't care about the peace in the future, I need to see justice done for what happened to me. And in South Africa, that was a frequent conversation because the people who had been the direct victims had more difficulty understanding the need to make trade-offs in order to, to move forward. And I think you're fortunate here in that you don't have to encounter, you don't have to deal with and confront with a problem of that scale. There is, of course, uh, uh, an, an episode in your history from uh, 2008. I think it's the 1st of March, is that the date? And so allow me now to just make a, uh, to, to speak a little bit about a concrete example here in, uh, in uh, Armenia, which has been uh, addressed in, in many countries including uh, in the United Kingdom and Ireland. I lived for, in Ireland for many years. I was the director of the Irish Center for Human Rights in the period immediately following the peace agreement in 1998. I, I served there for about 10, 11 years and I live now in, in London in the United Kingdom. And there's a famous treaty that was reached between uh, Britain and Ireland and, and, uh, that, that, that has brought about peace after 30 or 40 years of conflict in Northern Ireland. One of the things that had been, it was like a, an aching, it was like a, a, a rotten tooth, and the tongue kept returning to the aching tooth in that conflict, which was a, a demonstration in 1971 where I think 14 or 15 people were killed. And uh, there was a, a pathetic, inadequate inquiry that was held immediately after that left nobody satisfied except those who had been perhaps responsible for the killing uh, who were given a clean bill of health. And so they returned to that uh, about 15 or 16 years ago. And it was very important to do that. They had an, a huge inquiry in many ways. I think the sheer cost of it probably is greater than all of the costs of all of the truth commissions in every other country in the world combined. A huge, huge uh, business to inquire into the truth of what happened. I think that would be a very interesting type of initiative here and it might be an important part of a mandate given to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Find out exactly what happened. It may not be possible at this stage to contemplate criminal prosecution. After all, if crimes were committed in 2008, you had criminal justice institutions and you had criminal laws to deal with it and the justice system didn't deal with it mm -hmm. and so maybe it's unrealistic to say now well we can fix all that let's start let's 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 do it now maybe the justice system isn't ready maybe it will do it later but to get to the truth of it is a, is an extremely important important part of this process i i think Probably my time is getting to the end, isn't it? Almost. Let me just yeah. turn to one other element that I think is, a, is an interesting problem, and, and this was uh, mentioned by the Deputy Prime Minister, is the vetting 
issue. Mm -hmm. And I know my colleagues will say more about it. Vetting is a, is a complicated thing. As I mentioned, part of the, the, the political uh, compromise that's involved in being able to carry out this transition without too much mm -hmm. hardship and hassle is finding ways to raise the comfort level of people who think that they may be on the line, they may be on the list. And so with the vetting, obviously, there must be thousands and thousands of people who are thinking, is that, am I going to confront that? I'll speak only about one part of that, and that's the justice system. It's a particularly difficult and sensitive issue with the justice system. Um, and that's because the judges need to be confident uh, that they have secure positions in order to do their job properly. And a too uh, a cavalier or too, a too uh, abrupt approach to dealing with judges who you may not be very happy with, the judges of the past who didn't do such a great job, who didn't manifest high levels of independence and impartiality, um, that if you're too uh, ruthless with them, that you may unnerve the people who take their place, who think this is what happens to judges who don't do what the government expects them to do. I don't know how to get that calculation right after. I remember, and I'll conclude with this, having a, a wonderful, once I had the opportunity to take a long, long taxi ride with Albie Sachs, who is one of the great iconic figures in, in South Africa. He was a law professor. He was himself uh, disfigured, injured in a terrorist bombing by the South African police when he was an anti-apartheid activist. And then he went on to be uh, a, judge, a judge on the new constitutional court of the post-transition um, uh, um, South Africa. Uh, and we talked about the transition. He said, oh, I'd been involved in that. And I said, so how did you deal with these rotten judges from the apartheid regime? He said, yeah, he said, I was, I was on the commission of the Afri African National Congress where we had to discuss this. And he said, the young militants there said, Let's just fire them all. We'll fire all the bad ones. We'll get rid of them. Most of them are bad. There were a few good ones. We'll keep the few good ones. We'll get rid of all the bad ones. And he said, he said, I said, asked them, I said, how are you going to be able to tell that? How are you going to sort that out? Who were the bad judges and the good judges? He says, that's, that's going to be pretty hard. And they said, okay, well, we'll just get the really bad ones. And he said, well, that's going to be a problem too, <laughs> finding, identifying them. And he said, finally, we just figured they'll get old and they'll either die or reach mandatory retirement. Well, I'm not prescribing that for Armenia, but I'm saying it's one of the problems, and you, you do want to be looking ahead. Remember, you have to respect the rule of law, and you have to respect the rule of law in dealing with the people uh, who you would, you know, in the old days, you would deal with more abruptly because you wouldn't have the European Convention on Human Rights to think about. But it's more important than that. It's you want to be careful about sending a message to the new people in the system that they too will be, uh, uh, are, they're being watched and that this could happen to them too. And particularly when judges are concerned, you want them to know that they're untouchable pretty much as long as they behave uh, in an honest and non-corrupt manner. With that, I think I should stop and we'll have more to hear from. And you have questions, don't Thank you? Thank you. Oh. Yes, I actually do have one question. I, um, you were using the term when you're ready, when society is ready, uh, uh, related to uh, when the levers of transitional justice may or may not be pulled. Um, in preparation for this discussion, I was reading a report from our neighboring country, from Georgia, uh, related to an International Center for Transitional Justice report that was done just last year in uh, 2017. And interviews who were asked about whether they felt transitional justice should or should not be implemented in Georgia pointed um, to the need for, although people uh, said, yes, we do need to deal with the past, but it seemed that outside of victim communities and outside of civil society, the wider public was prioritizing economic prosperity over dealing with the past. Uh, I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts or anyone else on our panel who would like to, uh, because this is something that's being discussed 
here in Armenia, on social media, and it's, it's really a, sort of a point of contention. I don't think anybody could give you a, a correct answer on the proportions of justice, economic prosperity, peace, tranquility, all of those things. As I say, we, we don't have a legal rule, and I wish I could recommend an app where you could just, you know, <laughs> go onto your iPhone, punch in some of the givens, and they would tell you the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, 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 what's important in, uh, and it, it's a recognition in the last quarter century, that is, by the way, informed by human rights institutions. If you don't deliver some justice, Strasbourg is going to, you know, wrap you on the knuckles and say, you better, you have to do some of it, because it's required as well. So justice is necessary in, in different forms, and Armenia may provide a very good model, one way or another, you're going to end up in Strasbourg mm -hmm. uh, on this, for sure. Mm -hmm. This will be tested, and hopefully you'll find, um, uh, you'll find ways forward on this, and, and, and uh, mi mixes of the, of the, let's get on and you know, make some more money, and let's deal with the past, and let's satisfy the victims, that will be satisfactory enough that you'll get the blessing of, well, you need to get nine out of 17 judges in the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, um, you probably won't win every time on that either, but to, 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 to come up with a relatively satisfactory result there, I think that's, the, Thank that's you. what you, that, that should be the target. Thank you. Um, uh, now let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Ms. Marika Wierda is uh, currently the Rule of Law Advisor for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has 20 years of experience in transitional justice. Uh, I should have said Esquire, she is an attorney, uh, including with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Center for Transitional Justice, and the UN Support Mission to Libya. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I should say it's really a pleasure to be here. It's my first visit to Armenia. It seems a very beautiful country. The Mount Ararat I found uh, very, very beautiful. And um, I'm very happy, uh, thank you to the Zorian Institute and to our other hosts. I'm very happy to experience your legendary hospitality. Um, what I will try to do today very quickly uh, is to focus only on three basic questions. Um, because we have a brief time. And the first is really back to this question of what is transitional justice, which requires also knowing what is it not. <laughs> so what is it, but what is it not? Then secondly, why? Why should a country do it? And this, I think, in Armenia uh, will be a big question. And thirdly, then, I will discuss does it work? And there I will try to come also to some of the more specific questions here of socio-economic violations and corruption. Does transitional justice work for those kinds of questions? So um, first, maybe a word on what is it? And um, as was mentioned, I worked in Libya after the Arab Spring uh, revolutions. And one can imagine in that region, uh, people had many questions about this subject. And also, a problem was that the term transitional justice, it doesn't translate neatly in many languages. And in Arabic, in fact, the word for transitional comes very close to the word for selective. So people thought, ah, it's a politicized justice. So they were saying also it's extraordinary justice, it's special. We don't need this. What we need actually is a rule of law. So they were rejecting the term, but I would actually argue that there is kind of a, there is an agreed definition of transitional justice, even though there's also a lot of confusion. And I think through the experience of many countries, we've uh, come to a definition of the term that really centers on this concept of addressing legacies of human rights violations. So it's a, addressing system problems of violations, as was mentioned by the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, and you can do this through a variety of mechanisms. So you can choose judicial or non-judicial mechanisms, and usually you would build an approach using several of these mechanisms. But in the process, you try to all the time find the appropriate balance for your society between 
accountability on the one hand, about which there are clearly also international legal standards, but also reconciliation, a word which hasn't been mentioned much yet, but which every society grapples with, in fact. And to do that, the word transitional, therefore, it doesn't refer to the quality of the justice. It's not some kind of second-rate, soft, soft justice for um, that's a, an impression people sometimes have. It, reverse, it refers more to a window of opportunity that countries have when they are in political motion. So all of a sudden, change is possible. This is what a transition is. And in that window of opportunity, more may be possible than previous. Uh, having said that, also, I do believe it's global. Um, already, um, Professor Shebus gave us a wonderful overview of all the origins, but everywhere where also where I've been in recent years, uh, people are grappling with this issue to some extent or another. Of course, uh, in the Middle East very recently, uh, big questions, but even in, uh, in other societies, Canada had a truth commission uh, for the First Nations and for the fact that many children were kidnapped from First Nations or from uh, the indigenous people. You know, Australia, um, there are many uh, countries dealing with parts of their history which sit uncomfortably and which need addressing in order to move forward. And in that sense, uh, you really need to be context specific. Every country needs its own tailored approach. And I can't stress this enough. The international experiences, they should never uh, serve to dictate what you should do. They could only serve to, in a sense, inspire and to, to, un, to, uh, to um, spark creativity. And lastly, in terms of what it is or what it is not, I think the how is more important than the what. And this was alluded to also earlier, the process of how you do it, the process of national dialogue and consultation. Um, and involving the victims, this is what leads to the more transformative aspects of transitional justice. And essentially, um, transitional justice should try to seek transformation. This then comes to the question of why. And uh, to my mind, really, and I think also, um, you know, it's in many countries, uh, people will legitimately ask, do we need to go back to the past? It's either painful or it's, uh, it, it could cause further conflict. It's disruptive. Uh, shouldn't we be forward looking? Uh, but to my mind, exactly transitional justice, the strongest rationale for it is in fact forward looking. So it should never be about revenge. Uh, it should really be about the, an eye to the future and forging that new future based in fact on a new covenant. And this is where this concept of the social contract comes in. And many people have written about this. Um, if you've had the chance to read any of the work of the former rapporteur for transitional justice for the United Nations system, he's written quite a lot on civic trust and the importance of rebuilding a civic trust um, in post-conflict or post-authoritarian context. So, uh, in fact, um, as it was said by the philosopher Santanaya, who's a Spanish philosopher, he said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So this issue of non-repetition and prevention of further violations, I think is really at the core and the root of transitional justice, and therefore it does justify uh, looking at a past, no, ma no matter how troubled, um, in order to, to know what to do in the future. Um, and together with that, and this was also already alluded to, transitional justice gives us problems of scale. And this is really also why it's difficult to use the ordinary justice system, is because numerically uh, there are too many violations. There are too many victims, too many perpetrators. Um, and this means that we need to find uh, new approaches. So this has a technical dimension, but I should say it's technical, but it should not be mechanical. Um, sometimes uh, in recent years, because transitional justice has existed 25 years, you have, of course, people who travel the world, who give advice. It's become almost a matter of a checklist approach, but it should never be that. <laughs> Avoid the checklist approach, it's technical but not mechanical. 
and it is political, but it's not politicized. So it should always be based on in, in standards which cannot be derived from political bias. But of course, uh, transitional justice takes place in a political context. So what do we know about whether it actually works? And here um, I want to come to a difficult question which has received much debate in transitional justice circles because for now uh, I will venture to say <laughs> that in the case of civil and political rights, the kind of rights for which um, we saw you know, the experiences East, either in Eastern Europe or in Latin America where there were widespread disappearances and even the creation of victim groups such as mothers or grandmothers of the disappeared. Uh, also South Africa, if you think of some of the terrible violations that took part under apartheid. So we know quite a bit about how transitional justice works for addressing human rights violations. And there's quite some, I, I would say, consensus that this is necessary. Uh, and that consensus, you know, you can find it in a whole variety of also international conventions, human rights standards, uh, even the creation of the International Criminal Court. Uh, so in general, there is perhaps more acceptance that it's important to address human rights violations internationally than there is on the socio-economic front. And there has conversely been quite a lot of discussion about whether it's actually appropriate to use transitional justice for corruption or for socioeconomic violations. And here you can think of even South Africa. I was reading a very, very interesting article yesterday in, in Foreign Affairs. It's an issue they published last year, but it's all about past, the past and how countries dealt with their painful past. In South Africa, apparently, um, after the transition, the ANC kind of departed from its leftist roots. And it ended up doing quite some bargaining with the big business because it also felt that it needed to um, enter, in a sense, the world of capitalism and play with the big boys in order to keep South Africa on the map as a viable economic power. And they did play with the big boys. And as a result, several um, issues which were discussed kind of during the TRC era, including having, for instance, a wealth tax on wealthy South Africans, which of course, tended to be predominantly white. A lot of those ideas went out the window. And in fact, it's only this year um, where they've had um, a quite innovative process. It's called a People's Tribunal. And it, this People's Tribunal in South Africa now um, is looking at issues of corruption um, and of state capture and of arms trading. And you may say corruption, maybe it's necessary because they had Zuma and we all know he was involved in large scale corruption. But some of the conclusions of this process were that the corruption really happened much earlier and that it was in fact already part of that uh, post transition uh, period, which, you know, Nelson Mandela was ahead. You can't get more political good faith than that. But, um, but the South African process didn't address um, the very fundamental socioeconomic inequalities that were part of South African society, and that remain a problem today. And in fact, scholar Mahmoud Mandani um, has written very famously on how uh, transitional justice in South Africa never addressed who benefits from apartheid. What were the systems that benefited and what is, was their accountability? And so really I think uh, in transitional justice we should be thinking more about um, ways to address structural issues in our society uh, ways to implement institutional reforms that really go to these questions of um, systemic inequalities or systemic legacies of violations. And these can include socio, socio and economic violations, I do believe. Um, that brings me, of course, uh, to a very brief discussion of the, the transitions in the Middle East, because I think there are a couple of lessons that are valuable. Um, of course, those transitions were very much motivated by the fight against corruption. One can think of Tunisia, the young man who set himself on fire. He was in fact uh, just a fruit seller, but he was being harassed by the police every day to pay, pay bribes, pay bribes. So um, one day he got so fed up, he went to the government building 
to file a complaint and they didn't even allow him in the building because he said he's not of the right class to enter etc he got so desperate he set himself on fire so at the root of those um, and at least um, in Egypt and in Tunisia at the root of those um, uprisings or revolutions were socio-economic equality issues so one can ask now seven or eight years later how have they done and in Tunisia in fact they had of course in the first instance two commissions of inquiry, one looked at corruption and one looked at human rights violations. Um, they made good findings, but they had to go one step further. And the Truth and Dignity Commission in Tunisia is also looking at corruption issues, but had the mandate to pass those for prosecution um, to specialized chambers. And those specialized chambers have not been set up. And of course, what's happened in Tunisia and also to, to, to some extent dramatically in Egypt, in fact, is that some of the gains of the revolutions have been reversed because gradually, um, and in Tunisia also, there was a, a kind of a deal, I would say, between uh, the elites and business people uh, to, in order to say, let's uh, be very forward-looking in this country. Yes, we have a truth commission, and yes, we'll look at civil and political violations, including deaths that happened during the revolutions. Uh, but let's also keep the economy moving forward. Let's invest in development. And in Tunisia now, um, recently, uh, they've tabled what they call an economic reconciliation bill. And so there would, in fact, be amnesties uh, for corruption. Uh, but, um, you know, there, it is possible to think of in interesting formula, I think, to play with amnesties for corruption. Because, indeed, if people are willing to return the money, um, there is no prohibition, certainly, on amnesties for economic crimes internationally. So this is something interesting to think about. Another issue that was very, very dominant in the Arab Spring transitions was vetting. Uh, so basically, there was the idea in Tunisia, but also in Libya, for instance, that people who had been part of the Gaddafi regime should not have any place in the new political order, so they should be excluded from any kind of public service. Uh, now, in Libya, this idea, unfortunately, they took it one step further, and they, in fact, what they called it is they called it political isolation. So they passed a law on political isolation, but the big problem with it was that it was not based on individual conduct. So instead of looking at uh, the conduct of a person and whether they were involved in human rights abuses or corruption, Instead of that, they were looking purely at political affiliation. And had you been part of a revolutionary committee under the Gaddafi regime, or had you in any way propagated the Green Book, etc. Uh, so in the end, they ended up trying uh, to expel large numbers of public servants from their positions. And this has led to incredible backlash, as you can imagine. And part of the chaos that persists in Libya today is in fact because of that political isolation law. And so I think the main lesson there is really that if you are to do any kind of vetting, it must be based on individual conduct and it must also um, uh, take place in a way that respects the due process rights of the people involved. Because after all, uh, transitional justice, is, if it is to rebuild the social contract and to reaffirm the rule of law, then it should take place in a way that respects the rule of law. And that sounds very, very simple, but it's very difficult in practice. And so um, I think there is a lot of food for thought about how exactly you do that. Having said that, I think there is also a chance to innovate. Um, also, um, Professor Shedus already said that. But I don't think that just because Armenia is a unique case, and I will finish with this, I don't think that means, oh, it's not a question of does transitional justice apply or not. It's more a question of how do you make transitional justice work for you? And what is necessary uh, to build a process that fits for Armenia? And in these issues of vetting, for instance, what you can think about is uh, positive incentive structures. Um, for instance, these judiciary in South Africa, uh, one thing they did do quite often is to encourage judges to take early retirement 
um, and to say you do that in your full honor, etc., but you're just not going to the bench anymore. And we don't want to see you in court, but you have, you know, this option. Um, in Libya, we discussed also those options, but yeah, they they weren't unfortunately implemented. Um, so, in general, a, a study on Eastern Europe and on the vetting mechanisms there showed that there was more success in uncovering truth with systems that used incentives than with systems that used only pure investigation. Uh, so this is, I think, a very interesting uh, issue. Um, I do think at all times um, it's extremely necessary to keep this issue of public consultation and national dialogue at the heart of what you do and to have people-centered approaches to this, this issue, which um, have public support. The role of civil society in the media is extremely important. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there is no country that succeeded in transitional justice which didn't have a strong media and civil society input. They were always the drivers of the process, and that needs to be um, the same, um, I think, here. But having said that, yeah, I think there's a chance to innovate and to show political leadership and even to accept the challenge to undertake this more uh, challenging issue of long-term institutional reform. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have just one question, the uh, concept of social contract. Mm -hmm. um, the social contract between uh, the people and the state, between citizens among themselves. Um, what I'd love to delve into just briefly is what processes uh, from other countries or, you know, perhaps from the Middle East, perhaps from the Latin American co countries, can we take as examples to uh, rebuild that social contract? Yeah, it's an extremely difficult question because I had already mentioned South Africa. I think many people think of South Africa and the progress that was made in their social contract post-apartheid. And to give credit where credit is due, I think often people think of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But personally, I, I don't know whether that was really the foundation. I would say maybe the constitutional process in South Africa and the way in which they framed their new constitution uh, was very, very essential for their social contract formation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it went very far in setting the building blocks to the other components. Uh, having said that, you know, I think there were also these failures in the social contract where there had really, I think, been a, a notion that the new South Africa would allow for dignity also for everyone and for a measure of social equality. And this is something I think that still remains a live issue to strive for in South Africa today. Likewise, um, I mean, in the Latin American transitions, I think uh, they've gone quite far in, in, in a sense, rebuilding trust in public institutions. And so, for instance, in Argentina, post-dictatorship, I do think putting the military on trial was in incredibly powerful, uh, symbolically, because it was really showing that even the powerful are subject to the rule of law uh, and that the tables can be turned. Mm -hmm. I think this has many times been tried with international justice. And we've all seen images of Slobodan Milosevic or, or even of the International Criminal Court. But I think that symbolism is not as powerful when it's done internationally. Um, interestingly, it loses some of that symbolism of a society itself uh, putting in place the rule of law and judging the powerful. Uh, in the Middle East too, I think uh, Tunisia, for instance, has made a lot of steps, I think, in building their social contract. Some would say they had, uh, you know, uh, already taken steps in nation building, even under Bourguiba or under periods where they were more stable. Mm -hmm. But I think recently readdressing the constitution, looking again at issues of repression and who was repressed um, and why, uh, through a Truth and Dignity Commission, uh, allowing for reparations for poor areas of the country, um, even for collective reparations, etc. I think all of these issues contribute to the social contract. Thank you very much, Ms. Weirda. We're going to actually, although we announced that we're not going to take a break, it seems we do have a request for a very, very short break. So, um, five minutes.
We can do that, right? <laughs> Let's try to do five minute break, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
We would like to start, so if you could take your seats, please. Thank you. Donna, yet her Marty understand Okay, we would love to start um, looking at my Zorian Institute and American University counterparts. Shall we start or uh, do we need another minute? <laughs> okay, <laughs> welcome back. So uh, the happy news is Barney Afako is on his way from the airport, uh, so he will be joining us and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, hosting him in this conversation. So we're going to start. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nadia Bernaz, who is an associate professor of law and governance at Wageningen University. I practiced that, by the way. Did you guys catch that? Uh, her research focuses on business and human rights by investigating the accountability of corporations and business people related to their human rights impact through international, domestic, and transnational processes. 
Dr. Bernas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really delighted to be in Armenia. Um, I had a, a tour this morning of the uh, memorial and uh, it was uh, very moving to be there. I also uh, want to say that I'm a French citizen um, and I, I talked to my mom this morning and I said I was going to give this presentation but I got the feeling that the highlight of her day was really um, as Navo's funeral and uh, and not my talk so uh, so thank you for being here um, so my field of research is business and human rights and the main question in this field is um, how to enhance the accountability of the business sector uh, for their human rights impact so that means looking at various things like human rights consequences of uh, pollution uh, but also things like displacement of population for big projects like dams or building World Cup uh, football stadiums. Um, but also it means looking at complicity of the private sector in the commission of international crimes and also the human rights impact of corruption and uh, so-called white-collar crimes. So today I will discuss past and current examples of transitional justice processes that have tried to deal with corporate accountability um, and I will highlight what I hope are opportunities but also challenges uh, in this area. Um, let me start with a few uh, general points. The, the first one is that while I will talk about accountability of corporations, what I'm really talking about is accountability of the private sector, and that means corporations, but that, that also means uh, individual business people, usually businessmen, but let's just use business people for um, to be uh, inclusive uh, in a transitional context. So this is not just about corporations, this is also about individuals. Um, secondly, uh, another general point in this area is that corporations rarely have impacts on human rights without the involvement of the state. Um, so when discussing accountability mechanisms for corporations, uh, one recurrent issue is uh, how to account for behavior that actually involves the state and the private sector. And sometimes um, it is difficult from a legal perspective to untangle those issues and to assign responsibility where it needs to be assigned. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, a related issue is that in many transitional justice scenarios, the public and the private sectors overlap considerably. Um, some business ventures involved state-owned companies. Uh, prominent business people may also at some point hold public office. Um, and especially in smaller countries, uh, political and business elites tend to, are hard to distinguish and tend to operate sort of in the same circles. So something also to bear in mind. Um, so my talk today is divided into, into two parts. The, per, the first part will look at past transitional justice efforts to hold corporations or business people to account for uh, their participation to international crimes but as well as um, um, corruption or economic crimes. And then the second part will be smaller but also uh, more forward-looking and um, I will look at current efforts internationally to enhance corporate accountability for their human rights impacts and what I want to do is try to explain how those current efforts relate to transitional justice and what opportunities lie there uh, in this relationship between corporate accountability and transitional justice. Um, so it's usually said that transitional justice has four components. Uh, justice, truth, reparations, and institutional reform. And we've talked about all of that already. So the just, uh, let me start with the justice component. Uh, ju the justice component usually means 
So a few points here of importance if you start talking about corporate accountability and um, the justice system. First of all, internationally, the International Criminal Court, despite efforts from some countries, including my own, France, during the negotiations of the statute, the International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction over corporations. Uh, it only has jurisdiction over individuals. Um, so those individuals, of course, in theory, can be business people. Um, so in theory, there is space at the International Criminal Court for the prosecution of the crimes committed by the private sector, let's say. Uh, but as we know, the International Criminal Court only focuses on very specific atrocity crimes uh, with very narrow definitions, and of course there are sets of conditions. Um, so it is very limited. Secondly, um, to talk specifically about the justice component, in every transitional justice scenario, as was mentioned already, choices need to be made about who to prosecute um, and sometimes to move on um, or to be pragmatic about it, only the head, only the leaders are prosecuted. And this is particularly important when looking at corporate accountability because the private sector, and that was the, the crux of the question to Marika earlier, the, the, the private sector is often seen as a crucial partner to allow the country to move on. Uh, the skills, the money, the connections, the knowledge, the know-how, how to do business, how to make money, how to create development and opportunities, uh, all of that, of course, is very important to either maintain an economy um, or rebuild an economy in, in, just in transitional justice scenarios where there's really the countries are completely destroyed. Um, so in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that it is likely to be counterproductive to say, okay, let's just, let's just remove everyone. Let's just get, get rid of them all because it, there's always this discussion about we, we, we need those people, we need those skills because if everyone goes, then, then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be alone and it will be very difficult to maintain a position on the world stage. So this is a complex and delicate issue and it's very hard to strike a balance here. Uh, I have a few examples of prosecution of corporate officials uh, in transitional context, but those are very limited. Um, for example, in Argentina, uh, a large number of the victims of the uh, dictatorship uh, who were tortured, executed, uh, and disappeared were uh, trade union leaders. Um, so they really, um, many of those victims were part of that um, group of people from trade unions. So with that in mind, some corporate officials at companies such as Mercedes-Benz, for example, uh, were prosecuted in relation to the treatment of those union leaders. Uh, but this is, of course, very specific. And for widespread, systematic, and more diffuse issues such as corruption, um, it is hard, I, in my opinion, it is very hard. And also, it's been shown in previous um, examples that it's hard to rely solely on prosecutions because of the standard of proof that needs to be upheld in criminal prosecutions and also because of limited resources. I mean, everyone who's had here in this room any experience in the justice system, you will know that to prosecute someone and to do it right, it costs money. There's, there's no way around it. It takes time. You need to allow people some time to defend themselves, etc. And this is just, this just takes a lot of resources. Um, so the tendency, therefore, in prosecutions is to focus on just a few selected prosecutions, but this really is very difficult to do across the board for issues that are as widespread and diffuse as, as corruption. So partly for that reason, when it comes to corporate accountability, the emphasis in transitional justice has been put more on the truth component rather than on the, the uh, prosecution component. So the truth component, of course, 
truth can emerge out of prosecutions. This is not just in truth commissions uh, that truth can emerge. But mostly what I want to talk about here is truth commissions. Uh, and of course, we've, we've heard about some of them already. And a few of those truth commissions in the past uh, have dealt with corporate accountability in more or less detail. So in South Africa, um, Interestingly, the South African Truth Commission um, held um, uh, meetings for two and a half years and famously only three days out of these two and a half years uh, were devoted to public hearings on the role of the business sector in the apartheid era. Um, and those hearings led to a lot of frustrations um, and by and large, uh, corporations and corporate officials who appeared before the, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, all of them, of course, part of the, of the white business uh, elite, uh, presented themselves as victims of the regime uh, with the argument that the apartheid regime had made South Africa a pariah on the world stage because of the sanctions, etc. And then, in fact, they were victims of that because that kind of limited their business opportunities. So it was a, a bit of a reversal. Uh, and once you give people the floor to speak publicly, you cannot control what they're going to say. So that kind of uh, was generally seen as not a particularly positive experience uh, when it came to giving the floor to those business leaders to hear what they had to say. Um, nevertheless, uh, in this final report, which I think is of importance here, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa distinguished between three levels of responsibility for the business sector. And they said, first of all, we have companies with what they called first order involvement. And those were mostly the mining companies in South Africa, because those were the companies who helped the government design and implement the uh, apartheid policies. So really those heavily involved. Um, then we had companies with second order involvements, and those were the people who knew their products and services were going to be used for morally unacceptable purposes. For example, companies providing armament, like light armed vehicles who were used in anti-riot um, 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 in, in, yeah, in trying to quash the riots, for example. And then the third, and this is where it becomes interesting, I think, in terms of uh, the truth element, the third categories of companies were companies with third order involvement, and those were those who benefited indirectly from the repressive regime, strictly because they operated in a context that allowed them to prosper and to make money in a way that they would not have been allowed to prosper in a different environment, which I think is closer to a sort of more diffuse, um, um, perhaps corruption mechanism than any of the other, uh, of the other categories. Um, so that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting uh, example to look back um, um, in this area. So also something that has been pointed out earlier, truth commissions uh, play an important role in telling a story and in sort of shaping a public narrative over uh, a particular set of issues. Um, so they tell a story about what happened. Um, and I think um, it, it's particularly Though there is discussion, I think, in scholarship about whether corruption can be included in that, but I, I do think that uh, if it cannot be addressed there, I wonder where exactly it could be addressed, and I think we could discuss that later on. But particularly for these kind of issues that are diffuse and, and there's so many people involved and, and, and you know, perhaps the way to do it is to put it on the table in a truth commission rather than... Uh, prosecuting only the le the, the head. I, I mean, I, those are not mutually exclusive either, by the way. Um, so that's the truth part. Um, then there's the reparations component, and we've talked about this uh, already. And Professor Shabe has said, well, maybe just ask people to give the money back, and then you know that'll be that'll be it. Um, and that, of course, was very much discussed in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and there were different 
proposals to try to, you know, for, for want of a better word, make the corporations pay and yeah. get money out of them. Um, so a wealth tax was proposed. Um, some other extra taxation on corporate benefits were also suggested. In the end, uh, a business trust was established with contributions from the private sector. They were made to pay into a trust fund. Um, so I haven't looked at this in, in great detail, I must say, but um, the, the little that I've read about it was that it's generally thought that the amount was not enough. Uh, and there were also, unfortunately, allegations of misuse of this money, uh, which, you know, is not helping. Um, but I think there's a bit of perhaps a bit of a lesson here that um, as soon as money is involved in giving back some money, there is also there's always the potential for mismanagement uh, or for theft, as as uh, Professor Shabers uh, mentioned. So, uh, some of the things that uh, could be explored in that context is reparations in nature rather than reparation in money. Um, so, for example, things like restitution of land that was taken away. Uh, things like forbidding certain companies or certain individuals to bid for public money ever again. Uh, you know, again, something future looking. You, you stole money in the past. Maybe we'll, we'll forget that, but you won't, you're not going to do it anymore. You have to retire, uh, stop doing what you're doing, and you won't be able to go for public money um, ever again is one of the things that, you know, has been looked at in the past. Also, terminating contracts, terminating uh, public contracts that were made with companies that played a role or work identified as criminal or, uh, or corrupt is also you know, one way to, to do this without going into a full-fledged prosecution or truth commission uh, scenario. Um, and then, and then in transitional justice, there's this institutional reform component now in corporate accountability that doesn't sit, of course, very well because by definition we're talking about the private sector, whereas institution reform is institutions, uh, public institutions. Um, so you know what, I'll leave that aside for uh, for now. Um, so um, now that. I've looked at some examples of transitional mechanisms that have touched upon uh, corporate accountability. I should mention, um, I didn't want to start with that, but I'll mention it here, that there are some debates over whether corporate accountability should even be included uh, in transitional justice mechanisms. And some argue that transitional justice should only be for the, let's say, the big fish. Uh, so the political leaders, people who held positions of power in the state, and that corporations, you know, we can just forget about it and, and let it go. Because more often than not, these individuals were not leaders, but were more profiteering from a system that, that allowed them to, to thrive. Um, I would... I would um, actually question that that idea that that transitional justice is only about the head I think there's th there's value in this but I think experience now that we've looked back at 25 years I think experience has proven that you don't change a country by just eliminating the head and I think if any examples from the Middle East can be taken you know um, uh, Libya and Iraq are just you know glaring example that this is not solving much to get rid of of people no matter how atrocious their, their crimes may have been so uh, I think I, I personally think having looked at corporate accountability for some time now that it's not a distraction to look at those issues in a transitional context I think it's essential uh, especially in countries where there's there's a, a, a close proximity between business leaders and political leaders, and this is this is not a side issue. This is a central issue, and this is what people think about as well in transition, right? What um, what are the risks? Are we are we going to be seen as, you know, not business friendly and not attracting foreign investment anymore? And those questions are are real. But I think if you just avoid that question, that's not really solving anything in the long run. So I just a few more yeah, minutes, just a couple of minutes mm -hmm. for um, just to talk about the current uh, 
international legal framework on corporate accountability and the, the opportunities that lie there, I think, to relate that to transitional justice mechanisms. So um, we have, um, uh, in 2011, uh, some new standards on corporate accountability that have been uh, adopted by the, um, the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, and what I'm talking about here, uh, um, the guiding principles on, on business and human rights. Um, and what's been happening is that a lot of countries have taken those principles and uh, adopted national action plans to implement those principles to see what it looks like to enhance corporate accountability at the domestic level. So many countries have national action plans, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, um, and in the region here, Georgia also recently adopted uh, one. They adapted one in, in March uh, this year. And what is very interesting in those national action plans is that they're very different from one country to another. There's really not one way of doing it. And some of, um, some of them have addressed specifically corruption as a particular issue of concern in terms of the human rights impact of corporations. And one country in particular, Colombia, has recently gone through a massive transition with a, a huge, uh, extremely ambitious peace agreement between the government and the revolutionary uh, forces. Uh, and interestingly, their national action plan on business and human rights and the peace agreement are closely interlinked. They were negotiated at the same time. And the peace agreement makes space for the private sector accountability, but also role in moving forward, recognizing that they have the money, they have the skills, and you cannot just get completely get rid of them um, if you want to move on and continue to exist on the world stage, let's just say. Um, so in terms of uh, the potential there, I think that it, you know, th those plans are really a versatile tool and they shouldn't be ignored in a, in a transitional justice discussion. Um, I think they, it could be helpful to look at that as one of the tools uh, in, the, uh, in the transitions if there is indeed uh, a will to look at uh, white collar crime and corruption um, and to deal with that seriously. So thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to check in yes. if um, Mr. Alfaco has arrived yet. Not yet. Five minutes, great. So I will then take the liberty of asking um, a question. Um, so regarding corporate accountability, so here's uh, Mr. Afako. Please join us. Um, thank, we're so glad you made it. <laughs> Welcome to Armenia. Um, so we are just wrapping up with uh, Dr. Bernaz and we were talking about corporate accountability. Um, in Armenia we're trying to shed uh, the vestiges of an oligarchy where the political interests and the business interests were one and the same. To what extent does that change or not change? Or can we reflect on that as um, something that may affect uh, how we bring transitional justice to Armenia? W with the idea that the conversations are, well, if we prosecute these people, the money will flow out of the country with them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, um, you know, this is a question, it needs to be said, that arises in basically every single um, transitional go country in transition that that I've looked at and uh, although there is no one solution for all this is something that you know invariably comes into uh, into the discussion and there, there's no there's no simple answer there uh, except to say that um, there are and I think this is the value of international frameworks um, they may not be binding and not this uh, guiding principles I refer to in my, in my talk are not, this is not hard law, this is not a treaty, you don't have to do it, but it provides a framework to start a conversation over that, over, the, over, uh, over those, those issues. And I've seen it in national action plans that have been 
um, discussed, adopted, but also some of those plans are work in progress in Indonesia, for example, where um, it allows a space for discussing these issues and for relating these issues to a, hum a strong human rights framework that otherwise would be missing. Otherwise, you would have this discussion in the vacuum, saying, yes, but what are we going to do? And we need these people. And I think the international standards allow to start a conversation saying, well, look, we're not the only people, we're not the only country who's had to face those issues. Um, they're common, and we can still have a conversation, and we can still be open for investment, uh, while, still, while, while also saying, listen, this is about the rule of law at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. right? This is about having a, a stable environment, so let's not close that door in the name of you know, keeping the money flowing in and, and yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and uh, so just in time, our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Barney Afako Esquire, a lawyer uh, who is a lawyer with experience in conflict mediation and is a part-time tribunal judge in the United Kingdom. Between 2006 and 2008, he was the chief legal advisor to the South Sudanese mediation in the Juba peace talks between the government of Uganda and the Lord Resistance Army. Mr. Afako, the floor is yours. Thank you. I take it that this microphone is on. I can hear that now. I, I wanted to talk about the, some of the experiences coming out of, of East Africa, which is as far away as you can imagine. But I thought that some of the ways in which uh, the different countries there, which have been going through a lot of changes, navigated their transitions, uh, might be helpful to, to, to this discussion today. Um, in, in the course of my uh, early work on, on conflict resolution, uh, when you come to negotiations or when you come to engaging communities, uh, countries about their future, you're often uh, confronted with or urged to adopt or promote a whole number of mechanisms uh, in the name of, of transitional justice. And I remember in, in two such cases, in, in the case of uh, uh, in Darfur in Sudan, on which I worked, and the case that was referred to in, in the negotiations with the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, we, were, we were urged to adopt this thing that was new then called transitional justice. And the more we started to talk about it, the more we realized that very few people really understood what this meant. And in the end, what we did was not to use the term, but to begin to ask the question, what kind of change, what kind of transformation do we want to see as an outcome of this process? Now, some, ch some change is brought through negotiation, but there are other contexts that I will refer to uh, which, which are driven by one political entity, still transformative, but is not a result of negotiation. And in those contexts, sometimes the way they frame the change, the way they frame the political aspirations, doesn't borrow directly from, from transitional justice. And I've always uh, reflected and thought that perhaps we need to have a clear idea about the transition in order to get an idea, a better a handle of what the content and the priorities of transitional justice uh, should be. Now, transitions are not, as you can understand, are not events, uh, they're, they're processes. And at their best, they are transformative. Uh, they seek often to correct what has gone wrong politically, uh, economically, in governance, socially, so that the society at the end of, of, of that transition is, is changed, looks, looks better than it is. So they're driven by goals uh, and, and a vision. And in the process of championing these types of transitions, uh, it's, it's obviously important to have values. Some of the values are to be found out there in international standards, international texts, but all of these have to be internalized and, and adapted uh, to, to each context. So context always shapes the transition. Uh, so the history of the country in question, um, its political architecture, 
social conditions, all of these will determine what the priorities of a transition are. And when we come to the transitional justice element, which we often approach uh, from looking at the mechanisms and tools that have been used, when we come to look at the wide array of choices, uh, we can then be guided by our own understanding of what the transition, the transformation, uh, the transition can attain uh, will be. In the countries of the African, of, of East Africa, they all share certain uh, features uh, of the continent of Africa, which are relatively young politically. Most of the countries are about uh, 50 or so years old, almost all of them coming out of colonialism new states which bring together various entities and languages and ethnic groups. And so the challenge has always been both state building and a nation building. And those twin challenges have often followed uh, the history of these states and led to tensions and led to conflict in, 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 in the country of my birth, Uganda, dictatorship and repression of, of various forms. But how did we begin to move beyond these crises occasioned by, by the failure to manage diversity in, in, in the new states? In Uganda, sadly, it was through conflict uh, that, that successive regimes were ousted. And the question was asked, what happens after uh, a regime has been ousted? Uh, the, the notorious dictator Idi Amin was driven out and, and died in, in Saudi Arabia. Two other governments after that uh, were, were removed. But in 1986, which is, uh, which is a period of transition I want to talk about, which, which had some challenges, um, we, we thought that this was uh, the, the beginning of a new leaf uh, in Uganda. And the way that the government then, the new government approached it, wasn't through consensus, because they, they took power by armed force. But what they did do was to identify certain priorities for transforming the country. And one of the elements was to look at what had gone wrong historically in the country through the violation of rights. It was also to look at how you would strengthen uh, the judiciary to protect those rights and how you'd address this uh, perennial issue of um, a scourge of, of corruption. And they did this both by having a clear political direction themselves, but they also set up a commission of inquiry, uh, which is one of those tools that nowadays is much more in the form of a truth, justice, and reconciliation commission. But at that point, it was merely an inquiry into the human rights violations for the purpose of making recommendations for preventing these in the future. Arising out of that inquiry, we then later had a much stronger constitution, uh, which not only enshrined the rights, but set up bodies that would oversee uh, the, the, the enforcement and application of human rights and make uh, governments accountable. I mean, the other element was, was anti-corruption, uh, which for the first time we then had an ombudsperson, a, a directorate of governance, uh, which would then enforce a code, a leadership code, uh, by which all those who held office had to declare their assets uh, every, every year so you'd know uh, where the wealth is coming from. And it also received complaints and it dealt with some of the historical uh, allegations and ongoing allegations of corruption. So in the end, the solution was not just political leadership but also institutional and you had to make choices as to which institutions you start with. Now, the story of Uganda and the other uh, story is that of Kenya, which also coming out of a similar colonial background, uh, faced a government which for a very long time was corrupt and predatory. And even when they moved from one party uh, government to multi-party politics, that politics was characterized by violence. And the reason for the violence is that politics is a zero-sum game. Those who win take everything. If you lose, even if you're just 49.9%, you lose it all. 
and therefore the stakes at every election become very high and 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 it leads it manifests in 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 violence and it was a trigger of the 2007 elections and the scale of the violence which 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 gave i suppose kenya an opportunity to address some of the structural issues in the society now quite apart from dealing with the violence in the elections they then took the opportunity to form a broad-based power-sharing government and they agreed like uganda had done eventually to a new constitution and it's in the constitution that they dealt with some of the key structural problems that Kenya faced. Lack of independence of the judiciary. So, so they anchored uh, uh, clauses about appointments of judges. So the president couldn't appoint judges anymore you know, on the recommendation of, of, of his friends or his own instinct. But they had to be interviewed. Uh, they, and it's a public process. Um, and, and their tenure was protected. A new Supreme Court was established uh, that would oversee uh, disputes, including election disputes. Uh, independent electoral body was established, and systems were introduced that would try to proof uh, the electoral process uh, from manipulation. And so it is a combination of, of, of politics and institution building. But even after adopting all of those mechanisms, they had a truth commission which went into great detail with the analysis of what was wrong with Kenya. But even after all of that, it was not easy to switch off uh, the, the structural problems. Corruption didn't, didn't die. Uh, even last year, they had uh, contestation with elections. But the difference this time and the importance of the institutions was that the Supreme Court could step in. And in fact, it annulled it annulled an election, which was which is a matter of great shock. But if they didn't have the, the, the institutional frameworks, if they didn't have the judges in place, uh, it would have been very difficult to to overcome what might have been what might have been a crisis. And they continue, as in Uganda, to tweak these institutions because the work of transition is never over. You have to revisit it. Uh, there are sometimes unintended consequences of the right things that you do uh, that, that surprise you further down the line. And there are always those uh, for whom transitions, transformative transitions, are a threat. And therefore, they will act uh, to make sure that its impact is slowed down or sometimes uh, reversed. But that is the stuff of politics. So transitions don't work themselves out automatically. They need to be accompanied by clear-headed political leadership that has a sense of priorities. The other point that I, I, I will make, and, and I'm conscious that I'm the one who arrived late, so I'll start to conclude, is the, is the whole idea of consensus and taking the population with you. Now, the transitions in East Africa that have been most robust are those that have had a high level of engagement and involvement of the population, either in the constitution-making process or in adopting the other laws <coughs> and, and policies uh, which come to, to, to reflect uh, the mechanism uh, that, that has finally been adopted. So there is almost an imperative, if you like, in, in, in the transition process to make sure that those processes, mechanisms that we adopt have the buy-in and continue to have the buy-in of the population. Because transitions can also lose their way. I mean, in Uganda and, uh, and some of the other neighboring countries, the sense is that transition that started off well uh, with, with good institutions, with clear leaderships and priorities lost its way because people stayed on in power and lost sight of what they were there to do. So, for example, the, the anti-corruption body that I was talking about, nowadays, its orders are being ignored um, because uh, we've allowed uh, things to slip. So there has to be uh, an element of vigilance. There has to be a strong element of, of, uh, of prioritization. Uh, you can overstretch yourself by doing everything at once. 
uh, in, uh, in, in a transition. And uh, because uh, often the resources are finite, the political resources are finite, material resources, uh, technical resources uh, might not be able to deliver everything at once. So those are some of the, the lessons coming out of uh, East African transitions. I haven't talked at length about justice. I'm, I'm sure my colleagues uh, covered that. But I wanted to emphasize the importance of leadership of a vision of transition which then frames the content and priorities of, of transitional justice and makes the choice easier. The choices are never easy, makes them that little bit easier if we're clear about uh, the society we want to see further down the line. I think I'm going to stop here. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, well, I have a iPad full of questions here. I understand that we are supposed to end at four, but perhaps we can extend, yeah? And we'll try to get as, through as many of these questions as we can. Uh, some questions, I believe, have already been answered, so I'm gonna do my best to choose questions that, I'm looking at our media partner there, Maria. Yep, so I'm gonna do my best to choose questions that haven't been answered. Uh, the new ones are new. Okay. Got it, okay. So, um, so how about we, we do it this way? I'll <laughs> ask the question, and then maybe perhaps one person answers it, and we go to the next one, just to try to get through as many as we can, if that works. OK. Um, so the first question is about prosecution. Uh, is prosecution as a transitional justice tool somehow different from ordinary investigation and prosecution? And if yes, please briefly highlight the main differences. Yes. Um, uh, I will answer this because I used to be criminal justice director at ICTJ, but I think the short answer is yes, it is a bit different. And it's back to this issue that we mentioned about scale, because there could be too many violations to prosecute everyone. And so what you see in many transitional justice contexts is that you have to uh, formulate a prosecutorial strategy from the beginning. And you have to, in a sense, investigate structures and organizations um, rather than individuals. Um, and then in the end, you have to decide where to put the priority. Uh, and that is part of your strategy. You have to decide how many um, and who, uh, you know, who in a sense symbolizes the responsibility for the violation that you would like to address. But as a result, it means in practice, usually far fewer people are prosecuted um, than you would think under ordinary law. But this is back also to the question of resources that Nadia raised. Um, it would be impossible to prosecute everyone. And you have to strike this balance um, between the accountability on the one hand um, and the reconciliation on the other, so people who are not going to be prosecuted should also know uh, at some stage that they will not be prosecuted. So these are some of the differences. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, related to asset recovery, uh, as we discussed, related to recovery of, um, of money. And to what extent are there defined tools or examples that in other countries and other situations that specifically dealt with asset recovery and how should uh, those tools be used? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can try to answer this. Um, this is uh, always very difficult. Um, I mean, I, I did mention the, uh, the South African example where um, they've decided to, uh, to create a trust fund uh, that corporations would uh, contribute to. Uh, but that's not really asset recovery. That's, you know, we consider that um, collectively corporations had at least some degree of responsibility and therefore we, they devised that solution which is not, you now asset recovery, usually you think about this, about you have one corporation, you've targeted it, you know what it's been doing or an individual, and then you're going to ask to give that amount of money back. And, and that, is, that is very difficult to do. And I think it relates to the question about who you prosecute, because asset recovery, uh, to me, 
has to be related with a strong, um, uh, with a high standard uh, criminal prosecution. You cannot just recover assets with a soft mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it has to be linked to something stronger. And therefore, um, I think in transitional justice context, what we see is more sort of softer solutions like this, or you know, paying a one-off tax, or or um, saying that they'll 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 contribute to the country's development in some way, rather than really targeting some some assets because of the lack of resources, mm -hmm. um, and and the fact that you cannot just prosecute everyone. Okay, um, I think those two issues are linked. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, the next question is from a um, former judge of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Alvina Gulumna, Gulumian. Um, there's two questions here, but uh, I think I will take the liberty of asking the second one, uh, which is related to the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights. So ha the question is the following. Has this mechanism been implemented in any member states of the Council of Europe and signatories to the European Court of Human Rights? And the question is related to clarifying whether the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights find systemic or structural problems are capable of replacing or otherwise substituting transitional justice mechanisms. <laughs> This is like a PhD defense, really. This is a, this is a tough question. Um, I, I was thinking about this before the, the session today, if there were examples, and I don't know if the other panelists can come up with them. There, there has been some uh, from the Balkans where they've had, but, but not dealing with the economic issues that we've been concerned with and the corruption issues, but there have been uh, trials following the conflicts in, uh, in uh, Croatia, Serbia, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, all of which are member states of the Council of Europe. And those issues have come before the, the, the European Court of Human Rights, including a very famous uh, situation where there was a, a political solution reached in the Dayton Agreement at the end of the conflict in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in 1995 that provided for uh, um, ethnic uh, representation um, and that excluded some ethnic groups because it was a compromise. It was a negotiated compromise between the Croats and the Serbs and the, the Bosniaks, the Muslims in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, uh, a Jew and uh, a Roma contested it and said, you've left us out. We can't be president. We can't run for office. And the court ruled that that was uh, contrary to the European Convention. Uh, there's, there's a famous dissenting judgment in there where the judge, one, one, the lone judge who dissented says, I can't go along with this, I can't go along with a court that um, in the name of human rights uh, may harvest a massacre as a result. And it was this, you know, this challenging problem of trying to apply fundamental human rights to a situation where political compromises have been made. I don't think they've entirely fixed the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but mm -hmm. this is, uh, I think in my earlier remarks I mentioned, I said you won't maybe score 100% at the European Court of Human Rights uh, mm -hmm. on, on these measures. The idea would be to have as much of them survive. I think that it's a very important feature of transitional justice um, here and in other countries, but here because you have the mechanisms and in particular, and, and this reassures people on all sides that, that there is that oversight, but it may cause problems. And it's a fact, it's, it's, a, it's a feature also of transitional justice. We haven't discussed this issue of uh, amnesties, which has also come up in some of the Croatian mm -hmm. cases. So if I, well, if it's on the list, yeah, I'll just next. say a word about it. I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, Marika Wierda referred to this saying that there's no problem with uh, the corruption issues, you could give an amnesty for that because it doesn't encounter uh, difficult an obstacle with international law. There is a, I'll call it a theory because I've never entirely agreed with it, that international law doesn't allow um, for amnesties for international crimes, which are, are not really what we're dealing with here, but genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. I'm not in real agreement with that. I think that it's all, everything is context specific and compromise is possible 
on everything. I think it's a dangerous idea to start getting into the idea that there are some legal red lines that you can't cross. Um, that that just is, is a, that, that there are dangers with that. And so uh, I'm nervous sometimes. I was involved in a case at the European Court of Human Rights dealing with uh, Croatia and with the amnesty there. And uh, we were concerned that the judges would say, you can't do that. There are some things you can't do. Now, they may do that. It's just something you'll have to live with. And uh, <laughs> okay. I'm not encouraging anyone to, <laughs> to violate the European Convention on Human Rights. I'm saying, you know, aim for a good score on, a, okay. on the compliance like with the comment? European Convention. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's much, much more detail on there, and the Inter-American Court, mm -hmm. they're the ones who've set a lot of the standards much more extensively than the European Court, to be but, honest. But if, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which was very, very uh, uncompromising on this, mm -hmm. has now uh, blinked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On amnesty, yeah. On amnesty. They've said, listen, really the issue is, what are you getting in return? Mm -hmm. When they gave General Pinochet an amnesty, it was like a, a gold watch retirement present. Mm -hmm. And now the issue is, if you get something significant in return for backing off on proper criminal justice, then we'll weigh up whether you whether we'll weigh up the 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 the, the cost and the benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's obvious with the corruption situation. If you can get if you can get some of the money back. It's not a bad deal to make a compromise. So this is the perfect segue into the next uh, question um, that's related to amnesty, but also deal making. Uh, taking into consideration the different models of transitional justice, do you think we need to come up with a new model here where we combine amnesty to some, making deals with others, and even appointing past officials in new responsible positions, and most of all, laying rest the idea of vengeance? And will we need to import unbiased individual lawmakers from abroad to implement this? How's that for a PhD thesis? Oh, very. <laughs> <laughs> it's, about, it's about three questions in there. I'll, ju I'll take some of the elements to Coming from the experience in, in Eastern Africa, and Uganda in particular, um, the people that we excluded um, always created a problem further down the line. And, and therefore, we started to learn that, that we would look very carefully, certainly, at, at who's been in office and who's now out, and those who could be of use uh, to the transition would be rehabilitated. So it's a political decision. Uh, when it comes to, to, to criminal cases, some people were tried and, and served long jail sentences. We still had the death penalty then. Some were sentenced uh, to, to, to capital punishment as well. But this idea uh, of, of winner takes all, the fundamentalism of, of, of power uh, we had huge problems with and started to change the approach uh, to make sure that there was a possibility for rehabilitation. Um, because uh, one of the features in East Africa, just to use that analogy, is that every political leader comes to the constituency. So if you, if you have the prism of individual responsibility, you ignore the constituency and you may foster grievances and, and, and you, lose, you lose your cohesion. As a, as, as a society. But that is a very, very context-specific uh, and nuanced judgment to make that you can't borrow examples from elsewhere. You have to make that judgment yourselves and you have to open the channels of communication across the political divides even as you make those, those, those choices and, and, and then be guided by, by the best interests of the nation going forward. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to comment on that one? Yes, please. It's just worth mentioning one controversial example of a country that got outside help, which is Guatemala. They have actually an international commission against impunity, which is helping to investigate and prosecute both human rights violation but also 
corruption and election fraud. Uh, but this model has been very contested also in Guatemala. And most recently, in fact, the president is trying to deny entry to the head of that commission uh, to re-enter the country. So it's a very hot political issue. It's been a very drastic measure. Um, of which some people would say it was very, very necessary to address a very deep impunity in that society, but others would say it's, it's a hard measure. Yeah. Well, let's piggyback on that. Yes, please. Dr. Well, I, I just wanted to yep. add a comment on this idea that you bring in uh, mm -hmm. foreign um, judges, experts, commissioners, or whatever. Um, I don't think that in any of the literature, I could be wrong on this, the UN reports, that this is ever recommended as something that's important. Some countries have done it. Uh, they did it in, in the case I was involved in, in Sierra Leone. I always suspected that part of the reason was that the United Nations wanted to have a few people there to keep an eye on the money. They had a problem of corruption in Sierra Leone that continued to the Truth Commission. And they wanted to make sure that, that, that there was some oversight on that. Maybe I'm a bit cynical here, but I, I think that was part of it. I wouldn't exaggerate the importance of that. I, I don't think that that's a, a need here, unless people in Armenia feel desperately that this is something that would give such an added layer of credibility. I mean, there are lots of consultants out there working in the field of transitional justice who will say, yes, you need us, you know, <laughs> here's the contract, we'll come there. But personally, I, I, I don't think it's a, I, there may be places where it's, it's useful, but they would be exceptions and special circumstances, and, and you would really need to do it. South Africa didn't need that. They had some consultants come, and that certainly there's a lot of knowledge. This idea, you know, do you follow other examples, or do you have an Armenian path? Well, yes, that's the answer. You do both. You develop your own creative approach, but you draw on a lot of experience now, expertise that's out there. But I think involving uh, outsiders in sort of decision-making positions, it doesn't strike me as, as something that's very important here. And unless you feel a crying need for it, I, I wouldn't think you would do it. Let me throw a curveball, because the next question actually dovetails on this, um, mentioning that we have a lot of prominent judges and legal experts in the Armenian diaspora. So people who are not necessarily living and working here, but who are ethnic Armenians, and to what extent should, can, how, yes, no, participate in this process? Can they participate in the transitional justice process in Armenia? You know, as you may know, there's um, more people living outside, ethnic Armenians living outside of Armenia. So to what extent are there examples of, uh, you know, people from the same ethnicity who don't, who haven't been living in that country, uh, participating in the process. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, um, Greg, uh, in in his opening remarks, um, referred to the uh, uh, a member of the diaspora who left because he felt he couldn't live in, in dignity, and he wanted dignity. And I think maybe there's a a very special commitment in parts of the diaspora of people who would like to come back here. And I think they would welcome the opportunity. I think if the doors were open to that, not to come as foreigners, but as Armenians, and they would have to come here and live and work here, and then that would be a, a desirable mm -hmm. thing. It would be a very nice message to send that, that the place is, you can come back now and have your dignity back, and, and we would welcome you. Any countries where this has been done? Ireland engaging the dia their diaspora, Israel, specifically on transitional, anything that we could look at? I think that'd be a very interesting uh, case study for us. Yeah. I can't think of anything. No. So we'll have to invent it? Yeah. <laughs> I think ICTJ has a paper on this, you could look at it. I think there was a paper written on this subject. Okay. Yeah. All right, so if there's no other comments, I'd like to move along to uh, Haik Hovanesian's question related to the Romanian model. What do you think on applying the Romanian model, namely National Anti-Corruption Directorate, as it's been inspired by similar institutions in Spain, Norway, and Belgium, could this serve transitional justice purposes more effectively? 
and, and hike you've put here in accordance with Armenian constitutional, uh, constitutional laws, but I don't think we'll probably won't get into an analysis on that. So would anybody like to comment on the Romanian models, and namely a national anti-corruption directorate, and if not the Romanian model, then any uh, sort of anti-corruption directorate that had, to do, had a, a role in transitional justice? I mean, there have they, been several anti-corruption uh, uh, institutions. Um, the, the examples I gave in, in Uganda and Kenya are, uh, are one of them. The national bodies, the weaknesses often is that they are over-centralized. So they would be here in Yerevan, but not out there. Whereas often these networks are not just in the capital, but are also devolved and decentralized in the country. I think it's a very good idea. They need to really have teeth and not to be subordinate to uh, other people's decisions. There's often a tension between the anti-corruption bodies, whether they should have, in addition to investigative powers, prosecutorial powers. Um, in Uganda, we found that prosecutorial powers were very important. So that don't investigate and hand it over to somebody else to mismanage. They can see through uh, the case right up to court uh, with, and they have rights of audience to, to complete the job, if you like. So I would go for something that really has teeth, that is not just a naming and shaming, but can frame uh, criminal charges. And, and that is also insulated and heavily independent, can't be interfered with in the same way we would protect judges. That's the model that we've adopted in Uganda. That's a model also in, in, in Kenya, less so. I think also there's quite some experience here in the region. Um, I'm thinking of Ukraine and Georgia mm -hmm. um, recently, Georgia in specific, uh, with various uh, constellations of models of anti-corruption. It's true, as we said before, the fields of transitional justice and the field of anti-corruption have developed kind of separately. So they didn't intersect um, all that much, but, uh, but as we said, I think many of us would take the view that anti-corruption can be part of a transitional justice package also. There is no conceptual incompatibility. And in some places, it's very important to look at them together. Excellent. And now here's one I think uh, maybe is not a PhD one, an easy one. Where did transitional justice not work and why? <laughs> there's there's a lot of examples okay maybe two can we have two? something that is most perhaps ap applicable to our current uh, situation <laughs> Well, I think previously we were discussing a little bit the transitions that have happened in the Middle East region mm -hmm. um, and the reasons, you know, there are many reasons why they've been less successful in Egypt and in Tunisia, but also Yemen, uh, Syria, <laughs> obviously there have been uh, Libya, many uh, less negative lessons of uh, processes that were tried but then morphed into revenge situations or in reversals of democratic processes. So, yeah, unfortunately there are, I think, examples. Um, uh, again, complex to analyze. And there's also the entire question of, uh, you know, are there examples of countries which chose not to have transitional justice and are they necessarily less peaceful? And the two examples that are always mentioned there are Spain um, and Mozambique. Uh, and again, it's very complex to analyze with Spain, I think, whether their general amnesty and or absence of a transitional justice process has led to political problems today. Mm -hmm. um, it's complex to analyze. I should mention I'm speaking in my individual capacity and not mm -hmm. as a Netherlands representative <laughs> because this is a tricky diplomatic uh, subject matter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, shall we uh, take two more questions? Yes, does that work? Five more minutes, okay. Um, well, I'd like to take this one uh, related to nationwide, nationwide consultations and discussions around the use of different transitional justice mechanisms are essential. Are there practical examples of how this was organized? In other words, bringing in 
the public into this conversation and any emph emphasis on keeping the consultations in line with principles of inclusion and participation. I know, uh, I think um, Mr. Afako talked about this a little bit yes. in his talk. Would you like to take it or? Yes, let, okay. me, let, let <laughs> me just give one, one illustration in which I was involved. Uh, when we were drafting and, and we completed uh, one agreement in, in the talk, Juba talks that you mentioned, we completed the first part of the transitional justice text which say there will be a special court for the most serious crimes, there'll be a truth commission, there'll be reparations, the usual mechanisms. But in there, we required the two delegations before the talks were over to go back to Uganda, to the communities, and discuss this agreement. And they then organized workshops and, and consultations right across northern Uganda on the topics that arose from the agreement to get the views of the population so that the second text, which is supposed to elaborate in greater detail the principles and the mechanisms, would be enriched by that. Uh, and nowadays, there are, there are additional tools uh, for, for consultation. Sometimes consultations take place through national dialogue processes where transitional justice is, is part of the agenda. And then are really sophisticated methodologies for making sure that views are collated, that minority views are not lost, that, that women participate, and so forth. So there's a lot of support and literature and methodology on that. OK, thank you. Um, this one in red, is that the one you want me to ask? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because, well, I'll ask this one, but I also actually wanted to ask one other one here. But let's go with this one. Are there cases where non-judicial mechanisms are utilized, i.e. truth and reconciliation uh, commissions, and not judicial mechanisms, investigation and criminal prosecution? I didn't actually quite understand the question. If you did, we can have, yes, please. I mean, I suppose the I suppose the question is, is, is there examples of places where only the Truth Commission yes, I think that's right has been tried? So maybe I, I can say a word about South Africa here because um, so they had, you know, as, as also Professor Shavis explained, they had uh, they decided to to deal with the past through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and they decided that that was going to involve amnesties basically across the board. Um, and uh, it's interesting, uh, that was the initial idea, and I think that feeds into the conversation about how this is a process that can evolve, because initially they said just that, and then in particular on the business sector, there was a lot of frustration about how basically they were let off the hook, that mm -hmm. they didn't, that the Truth Commission works if people play by the rules, which were, you come here, you talk to us, you are being, you are telling the truth, and in exchange, you get, you get an amnesty. But in the, if the business sector actually didn't in, in really engage with that process, they came, they gave sort of half-baked, you know, um, depositions, which were not really leading to anything, and certainly not admitting to any kind of responsibility. Um, then the the kind of the, the the mood changed about this and what initially the south african government said no we you know we will not go for prosecutions in the end a group of victims of some of the corporations uh foreign corporations present in south africa brought a massive class action case in the united states uh for recovery of assets basically and also for compensation for uh everything they have suffered uh, in this in this regime, and initially the South African government um, said publicly that they were not supporting that case. That you know they wanted to keep things in South Africa, and they changed their mind. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, they did say, actually, you know what? We didn't succeed in that. That Truth Commission didn't succeed in getting back this money. So actually, we we'll support those cases, and uh, you know you can go ahead. And, uh, and, and have these cases, which, by the way, were all dismissed 
uh, last year on jurisdiction grounds, so we, we, there was no justice there. But it's interesting how they tried to do it without prosecutions, or without mm -hmm. court cases, and in fact, turns out that, you know, they, they revisited that decision. Which you I need the teeth. Okay. Sometimes you yeah. do. Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, this is the last question. This is uh, sort of, I'm dovetailing on a question that was, ans uh, that was asked, but I'd love to hear all of you, uh, you know, maybe give one thought, piece of advice, wish to Armenia as we uh, embark on uh, this new journey, this new reality from your experience and, and everything, you know, that you have been through and you know about our country and our situation. If you could leave us with just, it could be a thought, a wish, a piece of advice or anything you'd like to say uh, to us as we embark on this journey. I'd say, shall I start? I'll say, uh, trust your instincts, um, interrogate the experts, uh, be as skeptical as possible about the advice you receive, and, and always go back and check with yourselves and, and each other that you're on the right track. Thank you. Yes, anybody would like to? Yeah, I can say something. Um, I would say, um, uh, don't forget the corporations uh, in, <laughs> in that discussion, um, and uh, and also try to not frame the debate as um, moving forward versus um, you know getting accountability for for past white collar crimes or economic crimes, for example. I think there is. There is a space for for doing both, and that space, and, and there is international standards that can be used and referred back to in that space, and that you're not alone in in doing that. And I think this international check is very is very important. Thank you. Yeah, from my part, I think it would be to really take your time to make these choices uh, and as Barney said also to reach across the political divides to strike this balance between accountability and reconciliation and to innovate, make your own way. A big part, a big part of this uh, discussion today and about the whole context is the terrible corruption of the previous regime. Corruption is a very pervasive phenomenon and it trickles down so you have the big you have large scale corruption which has to be addressed but it 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 seeps down into everyday attitudes and culture and these need to be changed and it has to be that when people are having dinner they don't boast about how they evaded paying taxes or they smuggled something into the country so that it's it's embarrassing it's shameful for people to do that and if they do it, they keep it a secret. They don't boast about it because it's antisocial. And, and to have that idea become part of, of the culture is a very important thing. And those are lessons that can be, that can be uh, taught through this process of transitional justice. Well, we've come to the end. Please join me in thanking our incredible panelists. Thanks again to the Zorian Institute, to the American University of Armenia for hosting this incredible discussion, EVN Report for the, the media presence and organization. So I think we have a little bit of time to chat over coffee, hopefully. Thank you so much. <laughs>